In the name of God the merciful, the beneficial, thanks be to God Almighty. God's peace and prayers be upon the Prophet, peace be upon him. From the beginning of the journey, we agreed to put our hands together in our search for the acts that most please God. Therefore, we pray to God to consider us as seekers for the acts that he loves, whether they were mentioned in the Quran, in the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or through the companions' inquiries of the Prophet, for the acts that most please him. So, if we agree to declare that we love the Lord by doing what pleases him, and in a way that pleases him, I shall ask you to open your heart to me and to open your heart to God Almighty, who is continuously communicating with us about the acts that please him the most. One of those acts can place one in the rank of the Imams of Islam. And I didn't invent the words Imams of Islam. In fact, it was found in the Quran. The adopters of this worship and, by the way, it's an act of the heart as well, are indeed the Imams of Islam. It's not necessary for someone to be a memorizer of the Quran or a person who went to the Hajj pilgrimage several times in order for him to be an Imam of Islam. Instead, he could be a very simple person, like you or me. The Imam of Islam may be living with you or a neighbor, a co-worker or a classmate who's placed with the rest of the Imams of Islam because of adopting this trait. The act or trait of today is one of the actions that most pleases God and the distance between the heart of the one who adopts it and the heart of someone else is like the distance between earth and heaven. Why can't this person be me? Why can't it be anyone who's listening to me now whom God has found this trait in? This act is trust in God Almighty. The difference between a believer and another can be measured by the level of trust in God Almighty. Let's try to look at the people who live in our neighborhoods and elsewhere, and the people who line up in mosques. We'll realize that their statuses before God Almighty are distant from each other, just like the distance between heaven and earth, and it's measured by their levels of trust and contentment in God. I'll talk today about a worship which is obligatory to implement because having trust in God is the root and one of the foundations of our connection to God Almighty. Please allow me today to tell you that when God said, and do good, lo, Allah loveth the beneficent, the scholars explained it as being confident and trusting in God, and that's what he loves. This is the reason behind talking about having confidence in God, Allah loveth the beneficent. Those are the ones who benefit by trusting and assuming and are confident in God Almighty. And before I continue to tell you when and how to trust in God, allow me to tell you why God loves the trait of trusting Him and having confidence in the Lord Almighty. It's because of two reasons. The first one is ideological and the second one is a practical reason. An ideological reason has to do with one's ideological belief in God. We don't only believe that God exists, in fact, we believe that He is the Lord as well. Everybody acknowledges God's existence. We must believe that He is the Lord. Do you realize what the Lord means? Do you realize what it means when we say He is able to do all things? Are you aware that God knows what is best for you and he'll do it because he is totally aware and merciful towards you? Are you also aware what the Lord means? This means that he loves to be trusted because it's related to the symbolic meaning of God Almighty in our minds. The origins of our relationship with God Almighty are based on the trust and respect between two persons, as the sociologist said, and this is more important than love. Because one may love someone else, but he doesn't trust or respect him. Therefore, this love will be destroyed. In order for love to be established, it must be based on mutual trust and respect. And God is the greatest example. How can we depend and rely on a God that we don't trust? We will talk today about the deep roots of Islam. This series is very simple, but it's deep at the same time in bonding and building the basis of the divine connection, which is the trust in God and the true belief in Islam. The second reason why God loves us to trust him is because the actions that connect us to God are based on trust in him. 
The scholars said that there is something called ranks or levels to God Almighty. And the first is trust. So if one trusts in God Almighty, he will be dependent on him. We'll take it step by step together. We must trust in God and maintain a connection first. Afterwards, we must depend on him. When one depends on God, he'll be grateful with what God blesses him with. When we're satisfied with what we have, we'll surrender to God and we will be true Muslims before God Almighty. So when one accepts what God blesses him with, he will love him as a result. One will be able to sacrifice for God Almighty. When God's orders are executed, sacrifice will come along with it, which is derived from love, and love is derived from surrendering, and surrendering is derived from acceptance, and in turn, acceptance is derived from dependence, and that dependency started with trust. So today, we're discussing the basics of building a connection with God Almighty. The actions that most please God and do good, lo, Allah loveth the beneficent, like those who assume the best of God. That's why God used to remind us through the words of the Prophet Muhammad, I am what my servant assumes me to be. And this is a Qudsi Hadith, which refers to the symbolism of what God Almighty does. What's the first thing that occurs to us when the name of God is mentioned? Is it someone who will truly take care of us and achieve what's best for us? Will God save us? Will he compensate for what we sacrifice for his sake? Will he compensate us for the charity we gave? We need to be totally confident that God will compensate us for what we gave in return. It's all about trust. Trust and only trust. That's why our blessed Ibn Masud said, Trusting in God is the ultimate belief. And our faith is reliant on trust. Since God Almighty talked about the imams who, by the way, I referred to earlier in this episode, I can tell you how to love the Lord now. We must understand and implement this trait in ourselves because we really need it in the middle of this economic turmoil which we're going through, among those young men who just graduated and can't afford to get married and fulfil their obligations, and in the middle of those bad people who could harm any of us. So we must be confident. If we do, we will be like the Imams of Islam. We appointed from among them leaders who guided by our command. Guidance in religion must be through firm belief. The firm belief is to trust in God Almighty. That's why the Islamic scholar Ibn Taymiyyah quoted this verse and said, Guidance in religion must be through patience and firm belief and through trust in God Almighty. Let's open our hearts today. Let's pray today and say, O oh Lord, teach us how to trust in you, because we are struggling through so many events in our Arabic and Islamic region. The nation of Islam must rise, despite the many revolutions, the tough economic turmoil, and people's fear of the future. Therefore, we can't live peacefully with God and be Muslims and surrendering to him unless we trust in God. That's why God Almighty said, And among mankind is he who worshippeth Allah upon a narrow marge, so that if good befalleth him, he is content therewith. The meaning of narrow marge is insecurity and worry. It's when one's falling apart and can't face God, or the one who's apprehensive about trusting God. And among mankind is he who worshippeth Allah upon a narrow marge, so that if good befalleth him, he is content therewith. But if good befalls someone, he will believe that God fulfills his promises, and believe that God is the only beneficent and only distresser. As a result, he believed in God only because of a situation. Let's say to God Almighty today that we love him by trusting him.
Welcome back, and let's agree together that if we want to establish ourselves as true and loving worshippers of God, and genuinely long to say that we love the Lord, then we must implement trust and faith in God Almighty inside us. Don't worry, because you are with God Almighty. Therefore, before I explain to you the forms of trust that God loves, and the times he loves to see it inside us, I would like to tell you a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he gathered the trust and pledged to God as a priority. He said, peace be upon him, ask God for wellness, because the slave will never attain anything better than wellness after sureness. Prophet Muhammad set sureness as the measure and everything else comes next. And so the best thing after sureness is wellness, whereby God blessed us with healthy bodies in our religion, in life and the afterlife. Let's take a step-by-step -step journey to learn the first form of trust in God Almighty. God loves to see our trust in Him when He first promises us. We live our lives and allow God to take care of our futures. Each one of us has hopes and ambitions. Each one of us looks forward and hopes. And sometimes hopes require sacrifice. Therefore, it's hard to sacrifice when one is not trustful and assured about the sincerity of God's promise, when he assures us that he will bless us if we sacrifice, he will be generous to us if we worship him, and he will reassure us if we come close to him. Let me tell you a story about trusting God Almighty before I proceed. I don't really like the exaggerated stories, but when I heard and lived this story, I remembered that God is indeed the omnipotent, and it's a term that we often forget, we only know it as information when we read in the Quran, but not as a belief. Listen to this. A person once suffered from kidney failure and needed someone to donate a kidney to him. All of his four children wanted to donate their kidneys, but he refused. He refused the idea of one of his kids living weekly. Therefore, he assigned £70,000 and he asked his children to announce it among the relatives and the close ones who may be in need of money in exchange for a kidney. He was from Saudi Arabia and he used to live in Al Medina. So he went to Egypt to undergo the surgery and to look for any Egyptian who could donate a kidney for him. He was shocked when a 17 year old girl came to him. He asked her about her story. She told him that her father died five or six years ago and her mother was trying to educate her and support the rest of her siblings. She was forced to leave school because her mother couldn't afford to finance her education. Therefore, she decided to work and to make money and help in educating her siblings. The man looked at her and felt that she was a hero and a person who was out of this world because of her unusual sacrifice for her siblings and mother. He took a decision that he would assist her and he was certain that God will help his slave as long as he helps his brother. This is God's promise and this is where the belief of trusting in God Almighty to fulfill his promise emerged from. The man asked the girl to keep the money and she went her way and so he told his children that Prophet Muhammad said the water of Zamzam is quenching and healing water. And before I heard such stories, I wondered about the reason for drinking the water of Zamzam at the time of surgeries, when we should only stick to medicines. It's God who ordered us to take medicine. Oh, my followers, cure yourselves. Verily, God has provided a cure for every disease. These were the words of the prophet. In the same token, God said through the prophet Muhammad, God will help his slave as long as he helps his brother. We must genuinely sacrifice and put our trust in God. So the man travelled to perform Umrah. He drank the water of Zamzam and prayed to God at the Holy Mosque and at the Prophet's Mosque. A month later, he went to the same doctor for an examination. The doctor checked his results and he was astonished. The doctor wondered whether it was the same man he'd examined before or not, and if he was the same man who was diagnosed with kidney failure. Afterwards, the man said that God cured him, and that was the end of the story. Every one of us has a similar story in his life where one may put his trust in God, and God in return fulfills his promise 
and blesses him with the unexpected. But Satan incites us to forget. Satan is the master of deception, and he masters every heart that has a doubt in God Almighty. How can one give up an indecent job when he's doubtful that God would bless him with a decent one? How can he spend his own money if he was hesitant despite the words of God, And whatsoever good thing ye spend, it will be repaid to you in full, and ye will not be wronged. Someone might be concerned about spending ten pounds despite the words of the prophet when he said, Fortune will never be decreased because of performing charity. And the prophet swore to this. Trust must be attained. Why must we know that God loves us to trust in his promises if we truly want to declare that we love God? Because sacrificing for God requires courage, and courage cannot be constructed inside us without trust in God. Who fulfilleth his covenant better than Allah? And Allah faileth not to keep the tryst. One of the first forms of trust that God loves to see in our hearts is trusting God Almighty's promises. Tell him, I love you, my Lord, with trust that you will fulfill your promises. The second form of trust in God is believing that he is the all-beneficent and the distresser of the entire universe. God doesn't like to see us attached to another human in our hearts and believe that he is able to do anything. No one can move or restrict anything in existence except God. There is no doer in this universe but God. And ye will not, unless it be that Allah willeth, the Lord of creation. God is the only one. No one but God can harm or benefit us. God indeed loves to see this in our hearts. We agreed in the beginning of this episode that trusting God is an inner worship which will be reflected in our actions. No person can take away another's livelihood. O oh, my follower, I am the cause of creation and I pledge to let the livelihood last. I cause the whole being and I vow to supply endlessly. Have I created you in my universe to inhibit my assistance to you? Have I created you to prevent you from receiving my generosity? I manifested my mercy in you. I bestowed my livelihood upon you. I kept my paradise for you, and I will not leave you until I honor you with my presence. Therefore, trust in God Almighty that he is the only beneficent and the distresser. Why must we love our Lord by not attaching ourselves to other humans? Because it's a matter of belief, and belief is the base of our religion. Attaching ourselves to others in matters of benefit and harm is a big crack in worship. In fact, it's a humiliation, and God doesn't like us ever to humiliate ourselves except to him. Because humiliation to God is pride. When we humiliate ourselves to God, he will raise us, elevate our rank, and appreciate us, because God honoured us. Verily, we have honoured the children of Adam. So it's not right to think that another person is responsible for reducing your livelihood, delaying your marriage, hurting you, or even benefiting you. That's why the scholar said a beautiful thing, which is if someone wants to take care of his needs, such as issuing an ID, a driver's license, or whatever, he must be totally confident that God is the one who assigns those people to benefit him. So when he asks those people to finish the paperwork, he's actually asking God and not that person. He's secretly asking God to accomplish it, although he's asking the person directly, but his heart is asking for God to help. Even if one wants to seek the help of one of his relatives or friends, he can look for their help, but his heart must be attached to God Almighty. There is no beneficent, harmful, doer, one who causes advancement or delays, but God. Let's make our hearts like the heart of a person of the groove, the young man whom a verse from the Quran was sent down about, and it will be recited until Judgment Day. His story, way before the time of the Prophet, and the prophet, peace be upon him, told it. This young man believed in God while the king was being worshipped by the people of his country. So the king asked for him and asked about God. The young man answered that his and the king's God is the Lord Almighty. So the king called for his soldiers and asked them to take him to the top of a mountain and ask him again who his God is. And if he said that the king is his Lord, they will let him go back to his people and live among them. But if he said it was God Almighty, 
throw him from the top of the mountain. Imagine how the whole world is now against him. He's accompanied by 50 or 60 soldiers who are loaded with weapons and ready to throw him from the top of the mountain after repeating the question again about his God. He said, I ask you, O Lord, to remove my distress. This is a factual story. They almost threw him from the top of the mountain and he didn't fear the 50 soldiers who almost pushed him off the cliff because of God. They can't contradict God's divine will. Therefore, they're unable to do anything unless God wills it. And ye will not, unless it be that Allah willeth, the Lord of creation. Let's say that we love the Lord like the man of the groove. Let's adopt, O Lord, remove my distress. Let's trust in God like the prophet, peace be upon him, when he hid in the cave of Thor, and the polytheists were looking for him, and Abu Bakr came, and the Quraysh assigned 100 or 200 camels to who could capture the prophet, and Abu Bakr, dead or alive. I visited the cave of Thor when I climbed up the mountain of Thor. If one looks downwards, he can see the bottom, but if one looks forwards, he won't see it. So when they reached the cave and they looked forward, they found nothing. Abu Bakr, the believer, told the prophet that if they looked downwards at their feet, they would see him. The prophet is teaching his nation to trust that God is the only beneficent and the distresser. Tell him, I love you, my Lord, with this in your heart. So the prophet told him, O oh, Abu Bakr, two persons must not fear when God is the third among them. Don't be distressed because God is with us. Tell him, I love you, my Lord. And we'll go through situations in which people are involved and one might think that they would benefit us or harm us. But it's God who benefits and distresses and we must realize that. And if the whole world gathered to benefit you with something they would never benefit you with anything that God hasn't willed. It's all done with his will. Livelihoods are distributed and benefit and distress are in his hands. Tell him from the bottom of your heart, I love you, my Lord. Before I tell you about the third form which God loves to see inside us and helps us trust in God, I must remind you that trusting God is a sign of leadership in Islam. We appointed from among them leaders who guided by our command. This is the trust in God Almighty. The religion's leadership could be earned with patience and certainty, and certainty means trusting God and having hope in him. Two people may be different from each other, although they may be living together, working together, praying together, and reading the Quran together, but their ranks before God are far away from each other, like the difference between heaven and earth, because of their level of trust in God Almighty. The third form that God loves to see in our hearts and make us sincere and genuine about our love to him is the trust in God Almighty's good choice in each situation we go through, each livelihood that God may give or take, each event or incident, whether it's humiliation or elevation, God will do what's best for us. We must trust in that. Let's memorize the words of Ibn Atallah. God will assist us to bear our destinies and God's choices are their witnesses. If one wants to bear anything that has to do with fate and accept it as a show of affection from God, he must witness the choice of God Almighty. And, by the way, if we looked back at our lives, we'll find that God was giving and preventing for our own interests because he gives to enrich and he prevents to protect. Praise him, almighty. Let's adopt this trust and let's remember the words of the companions when one of them said, the most hopeful verse is, and how ye were upon the brink of an abyss of fire and he did save you from it. And one of the companions said, the one who saved us from it will not return us to it. If God saved us from the hellfire with Islam and his prophet peace be upon him and the Quran, we will pray that he won't punish us with it ever, God willing. The one who chose paradise, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, Islam and his almighty's remembrance is the greatest in this world. We'll always choose the best for us. We must trust in God Almighty. Let's pray for God to forgive us for letting Satan shake our confidence in him. 
Can there be doubt concerning Allah, the creator of heavens and earth? Let's ask God to forgive us for not realizing his existence during the times of fearing for the future, for worshipping him apprehensively and for trying God, and God indeed will never be tried. We must trust in God, put our trust in him, assume the best of him, declare that we love the Lord Almighty with confidence that he'll never break his promise, sacrifice without concerns, be fully aware that no one can benefit or afflict distress in this universe but God and trust in the Almighty's choices. We will surrender to you, put our trust in you, leave our fates in your hands and direct our intentions to you because you are our Lord. I love you, my Lord, through a solid trust in you, O oh, the greatest in heavens and on earth. Until we meet again, I'll leave you with your trust in God's hands. Thank you.